So as everybody can see, I tried to dress like Maureen <laughs> today. Um, I promise not to ask you how you got that Uber rating. And I'll just start by saying that thank you for that lovely introduction and Michael and Karen and Susan um, and, to, and Kasha and to all of the um, major champions of the ascendance of women in leadership here. We are really, really grateful to be here. Um, Maureen, in addition to all the things that have been said about her, is the most followed columnist at the New York Times, which is no easy thing to achieve. She's the best-selling author of two books and a third one, I think, about to come out. She is also, and I can personally say this, an extraordinary champion of women and the advancement of women in leadership at the Times. And she is the personal stylist to every member of the New York Times here <laughs> from Cannes. So we're really grateful for that. And I have to start by asking you, Maureen, um, are, is this the epic battle of the sexes? Yes. <laughs> Was this, easy. Is, this is going to make uh, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs uh, look like nothing. Um, the funny thing is when in the um, 18th and 19th century when women were considered unfit to hold public office, the reason they didn't think women could be in public office was because they were too emotional. You know, too, they would be guided by their feelings. They wouldn't be rational enough. And you know the word hysterical comes from the Greek word for womb. And uh, so high-ranking doctors would make these arguments. And uh, so now we're in uh, 2016, and we have one candidate who makes all his decisions based on you know very hysterical feelings. <laughs> and we have another one who's very rational and cerebral. And. Uh, so a lot of the typical things are switched, including, um, you know, I just did a big story on women in Hollywood and why there are so few women directors. It's, it's like 1.9% of the top 100 grossing films. And one of the reasons is they don't think women can handle the budgets, you know, and there's such a narrow margin for risk in Hollywood. Women just can't handle money. So yesterday was like one of the most <laughs> extraordinary days in political history because we learned from the FEC filings that Donald Trump only has 1.3 million in cash on hand compared to Hillary's 45 million, and um, he, which isn't enough to buy a bare bones one bedroom condo in Trump Tower. <laughs> <laughs> And also, since we're here, you know, uh, there were a lot of weird expenditures. A lot of the expenditures were to Trump businesses or Trump family members, and also to a firm listed on the FEC filings as uh, Draper Sterling, <laughs> so, which is obviously a fictional entity. So um, <laughs> now Trump's fired campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, is being audited for that Draper Sterling matter. Um, but the main uh, crazy thing that happened this year as far as gender is that uh, presidential campaigns, the subtext has always been mine is bigger than yours. But this is the first year where in a Republican debate, the candidates actually spit it out and discussed whose was bigger, and Donald Trump claimed his was bigger. So, the, you know, that was something we never thought we'd see. <laughs> <laughs> and don't want to see. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it is going to be a huge, and also, uh, <laughs> also, just in terms of tone, it's really funny because Hillary, you know, is, is playing into the idea that she's the first uh, woman uh, on a major party ticket to run. And uh, so her campaign events have been, you know, she plays Katy Perry songs and Taylor Swift songs and um, she has Lena Dunham there, and they sometimes have the feel of a girl's slumber party. And then Donald Trump, on the other hand, when you go to talk to him in Trump Tower, it's very much like a Rat Pack 50s vibe, and he's calling the, wa the waitress sweetheart, and um, 
you know, just very, he has a lot of quotes, old quotes to Howard Stern where he says he likes his dinner on the table when he gets home and he doesn't really want to see the kids. He just wants to see them once they're raised. So, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of the tone, it's going to be very, in an exaggerated way, male and female, with some of it kind of the reverse of what you would think, and some of it like exaggerated what you would think. So, so you've spent all this time with Trump. We were actually all saying, the group of us here from the Times, you've probably spent more time with Trump than almost anybody else at the Times, and his unfavorables among women are extraordinary. What do you really think he thinks about that, and what does that mean in the context of the election? Well, I um, covered, he tried to run for president or thought about it a couple other times in 99 and I think 2006, and I would go out with him, and then he would sort of approach a little rope line that they had set up, and he would be really shy about it and think he couldn't do it. And then this time, it was almost like a bank robber who walked into a bank and found all the doors open. <laughs> I mean, the Republican Party was so kind of decimated, he just got it. But I did, um, in one of these interviews, I said to him, you know, you have a 70% disapproval rating with women. You can't possibly win with that. And there was this long pause, and he goes, 68. <laughs> because he had seen another poll, you know. And I said, well, you can't win with 68. But the Washington Post ABC poll came out the other day. And 70% of Americans disapprove of him and 94% of African Americans. And I think the Latino numbers are so off the charts, they didn't even bother to show that. <laughs> you know, which is, but to be fair, Hillary also has uh, the highest um, negative poll rating seen on her side. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a sad fact that when they poll people, the impulse is who are they going to vote against, not who are they going to vote for. So, so this morning, that's a, a perfect setup to the next question. This morning is about expectations, and you did this great piece about how we should think about Hillary's likability. You talk about Sally Field introducing her, the ultimate likable person introducing her to rally. Um, do you think our expectations of Hillary as a country are appropriate? Um, well, you know, again, in the Women in Hollywood piece, this is a big deal because the, uh, when the scripts come back, you know, to uh, creators, uh, the studio executives always say, make the woman more likable, you know, and um, they also say, they also say things like, how can this woman character be smart and sexy? <laughs> That's confusing to some male executives. But um, <laughs> it's one or the other. So Hillary has had, you know, most famously exemplified when Barack Obama in the debate said, you know, very snootily, you're likable enough, Hillary. And, um, you know, she has had that problem. But that's, I think, with her, because she's so contained, um, as opposed to Donald Trump, it's, it's just hard. She has a problem with people feeling that she's authentic. And the, one of the most striking things that's happened in any election I've ever covered is how young women went to Bernie Sanders instead of Hillary. And I think the, the, the Clinton campaign was really stunned about that. But uh, when I talked to young women, you know, they just, they, you know, they had a kind of more revolutionary sense, and Hillary is very pragmatic, and also, you know, they were looking for authenticity, and Bernie was this cranky 74-year-old socialist loner in the Senate, but he had a through line of authenticity on the issues. So on the, sort of sticking to that topic, you did this amazing parody a few weeks ago. I bet a lot of people here read it with Hillary and Elizabeth Warren sitting down for tea to discuss the possibility of a shared ticket. And you said something amazing, like the country isn't ready for two wonky women for the price of one. Well, that was a question <laughs> in the parody that Elizabeth it, yes. Warren asked. Because, you know, it's a very interesting, uh, 
division in the Democratic Party where you've got Dianne Feinstein saying, no, we really can't have two women. We've got to represent both genders on the ticket. And then guys saying, that would be really exciting. You know, let's just go for it. Um, I think it would be really exciting because I think that Elizabeth Warren could bring the Bernie Sanders voters and the young women voters, and she has, you know, that quality that they like. Um, and also, you know, when Bill Clinton and Al Gore ran together, people said, oh, they can't do that because they're both young Southern progressives. But then it became exciting because of that difference. But um, I think it will be surprising if Hillary does that because, one, she's very cautious. So I don't think she's going to want to take that risk. And two, um, Elizabeth Warren, you know, who is known as the sheriff of Wall Street, has videos that Donald Trump has been sending out where she's complaining that Hillary, you know, ha has been kind of a shill for Wall Street. So Hillary, <coughs> also Hillary does not want a running mate who would uh, outshine her. But um, on the other hand, Elizabeth Warren showed Hillary the way to attack Donald Trump. Yeah. And Hillary really owes her for that because she psychologically analyzed him and went straight at his uh, overcompensation, masculinity issues. So when she says he's a very small person, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she has that down, and then Hillary was able to do it. So, in that sense, you know, they'd be a great team, and it's double teaming right. him. Yeah. Hillary will certainly tweet better with Elizabeth Warren at her side. So, right. um, the big question that I keep hearing people ask you on the side this week, and it's, it's worth saying to this whole group, any chance there's going to be a con contested convention? Yeah, it was funny because um, we had a panel last night, and my colleague, Tom Friedman, who's my office husband, <laughs> um, he was saying he didn't even reserve a room at the convention because he doesn't think there's going to be a convention, and he doesn't think that Trump will make it. He's in such a meltdown. And journalists, obviously, were looking forward to a contested convention because we haven't seen one in our lifetimes. But. Um, I think not, because it would be really hard for Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell to try and wrestle the nomination away from Donald Trump, because Paul Ryan wants to be president someday. And if he's seen as the elitist who took it away from the populist you know, and, and gets all Trump's voters angry, that will hurt him. So I think they've just decided to kind of go down with the ship at this point. <laughs> Start over. On, on that happy note, my last question for you <laughs> is a decade ago, you wrote a book called Are Men Necessary? And I just want to ask you, how, how has your thinking evolved about the role of men in the advancement of women in leadership in that 10 years? Um, you know, my mom, when I did this book, said, do not call the book Are Men Necessary? Question mark. She said, call the book Men Are Necessary, period, because they have really tender feelings. So I ignored that, just like I ignored her when she told me to get a suitcase with wheels before I went to Europe for the first time. And, you know, I think a lot of men didn't buy the book because they were really hurt. So I think the moral of this, even though the answer obviously was yes, so I think the moral of the story is to remember that men have very tender feelings, especially when you're trying to sell books. <laughs> <laughs> or, and you've got to give a last word on this, when you're trying to run for president and impress a columnist. Give us one, one tidbit of something Trump said to you or given to you that demonstrates that. Um, I'm trying to think Trump, you know, you mean that about, like, what about Something Trump? about his ridiculousness. So one of the things you, I don't <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to be more specific. One of, the thing, <laughs> one of the things you wrote about recently was that there was an expectation he would move sort of closer to how one runs oh, right. a national campaign right. post-nomination. Well, this was funny because... Um, I decided to take uh, my boss, my new boss, James Bennett, who's the head of the editorial page, and our chief Washington correspondent, Carl Halls, to, to meet 
Donald Trump. So about 10 days ago, we went up and we had lunch at Trump Tower. And so we tried to ask him about pivoting, which the Republican, you know, the Republican leader is trying to uh, make Donald Trump behave reminds me of like a bus and truck version of the taming of the shrew. <laughs> you know, they're running after him, trying to teach him proper etiquette and language and stuff, and he's ignoring them. And so we asked him about pivoting, and he literally was like a little kid when you when you give him spinach or something. He went like this, <laughs> like at the word pivot. He was like. And so we realized he had no intention of pivoting. You know, he, he thinks he got this far doing what he's doing, and he wants to continue. The state of politics in America today. Maureen Dowd, thank you so much.